Thank you. Good. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning, everyone. Wade Gill here, and I'm going to be the driver today. So bottle up and put your seatbelt on. Let's try and do this multifamily virtual issue training. And I hope if there are any new bids on the on the line, this will be useful to you. And I recognize some names. So therefore, there are some people that are just coming back maybe for a refresher. I hope you'll find this also useful in terms of your do your multifamily processing. Today we're going to talk about mo mostly on the pooling processes and the system training. And then, of course, Wednesday we go more into the system. And on Friday we go into so a little bit more about the type three and type five and a little bit on document custodian transfer. So we're trying to make it as comprehensive as possible so it will help you with your with your daily processing in the multifamily space in your office. Next slide, please. And I think I know what slide is coming up. Okay. Yes, it's me, Wade Gale of BN Well, and I'm working today with Marbel Canaan, and we're gonna have James Lee joining us a little bit later. He's having some technical issues, so hopefully he can rectify that and and, and join us as part of our, the, the team. Next slide, please. Okay, as I mentioned, we're going to go through the introduction, which we did, the path of a pool, prerequisite for pooling, and we're going to also look at the Jenny May website information just to give the new users where you can go to get some information and also the look at the calendar, which will help you in, in, your, in your processing. Next slide, path of a pool. We're, the path of pool, we're going to look at the pool submission, the processing, the issuance, and the delivered diagram. We're going to talk a little about the MFP, the M slash GeneNet pool submission, final certification by the document custodian process to delete final search pool. And we're going to also go through some knowledge check. We might have some polls through, through, throughout there in our, in our session. So just want to make sure everybody's attuned and we're keeping you on, on your toes. Make sure you're involved and be a part of the session. Next slide. Okay, the first thing we want to look at is the path of a pool. Currently, of course, you as issuers, you're currently either using JennyNet if you're doing your finishing up your, your draws that were initially started on JennyNet. And most of you, I'm assuming right now, is using MFPDM. That's the Multifamily Pool Delivery Module, MFPDM. So you'll hear that a, a quite, quite a few times. So this diagram just kind of give you an idea what happens in your world, the custodian world, and what happens when it comes into our world. So the pool pooling requirement, issuers must be enrolled in GeniNet and GMAP via MyGenime. Most of you have actually done that over the last year or so with you had to go through the enrollment. You had to go through setting up your org, your org admin and the org admin had to go up setting up your users. To submit pool, users must have available pool number, sufficient commitment authority, and approved master agreement. So those are some of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit later. So you have number one diagram, talk about the pool submission. The second diagram is the, is the final certification. Of course, the third diagram is what happens in our world. So the issuer, number one, submits a pool through either MFPDM or GeniNet. Number two, the document custodian certifies, of course, after they have done their due diligence on the, on the documentation that they receive. And number three, GeniNet network swept at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 9 p.m. for certify pool. Now, that's what happens once you submit. Now, in our world, we, this is what happens on, on GenMay system, pool issuance and delivery integrated pool management system. Gen may have a system called IPMS. Of course, we're always used to those many acronyms that we use. Pool files are revalidated. Yes. So even although the pool passed through GeniNet or MFPDM and is certified by the custodian, when that pool is actually uploaded and down to the Gen may system again, it runs through another validation. We want to make sure that the edits pass and edits are correct. So it does go through that again. 
pool files revalidated on the new pool processing system and NPPS in IPMS. New issue file with QSIP number is submitted to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. When everything there is done, approved for pool issuance. That means at four o'clock, sometime you might have calling you, you might hear us say, "Oh, you can't make any changes now. We are we just finished submitting our pools off to the the Fed." Every day at four o'clock, Monday to Fridays, I should say, at four, we actually do our due diligence and submit that information. We release our pools and submit them off to the Fed. Pool delivery file created for pool sub settlements, approved for pool issuance. And once all of that stuff is done, all that information is stored on Genemay Central Registry. So Genemay has all the information there on the pools that were released. We call it release in our shop. That mean it's out of our hands now. It's on, onto the Fed for settlement. So this gives you an idea what happens in the world. In pooling requirements, that's mostly what's needed to get into the system or set up your GeniNet piece. On, num on the second section, of course, you, the issuer, submits your pool. You either do your import or you do them manually. You send it off to your custodian. Your custodian reviews, certifies. If the custodian finds any discrepancy at that point, they have the ability to reject. And then and then it, once the pools are certified, anything that's marked certified, we sweep the network at 2 p.m. and then again at 9 p.m. And then the second, the third piece just tells you what happens in our world. Most of the time you don't see that piece, but that's we have to do certain things to actually get those pools issued. Next slide, please. Final certification. We have final certification here because if you are a multifamily, you know, once you once once the pool is certified by the custodian, it's it's actually final certified. That's why we did that there. If you were coming from a single family world with the Gen May one regular pools like the XSF or MSF, you know that those pools are not initially final certified. They're cert cert final certified within 12 months of issuance. Geninet network is swept twice each business day for processing and issuance of pools for final certified, by pools final certified by the document custodian. Talked about this uh, not in the previous slide. 2 p.m. sweep, certified pool slash loan packages. Pools certified prior to 2 p.m. East, Eastern Standard Time will be considered day one processing and may be delivered for settlement the next day. So that makes sense. If you came in today and you're processing your pools right now, because you, you're, you do good multitasking, you're processing your pools and you actually get them out of your office before 2 p.m. and they're certified by, before 2 p.m. by the custodian, those pools will be a part of the 2 p.m. suite. So you just wanna take that in consideration if you wanna get, and for that, that's considered next day processing. So that pool is one day processing, I should say. So that pool will be released today and it will be ready at, for the, the Fed can make the delivery the next day, if your delivery was the next day or whatever day you have there. So that's one day processing and it, anything, that comes in at 2 p.m. is processed and delivered the next day. Then we have the 9 p.m. sweep. 9 p.m. sweep is anything that was certified by the custodian after, after that 2 p.m. So that's why we do sweep the network twice, 2 p.m. and 9 p.m. Will be considered a two-day processing and may be delivered for settlement in two business days. So if that pool was certified after 2 p.m., we're going to download that pool tonight in our 9 p.m. sweep. It's going to be a part of our work in the morning. We're going to release the pool at 4 p.m. tomorrow. So, that, so that's day one there up until 4, and then the next day becomes day two. So that's the, the difference in the day two processing. Anything you get released by, you have certified before 2 p.m., we are going to be, that's going to be a part of the 2 p.m. sweep. And that can help you with your settlement because that pool can be settled the next day, but it depends on the Fed will deliver your settlement, your pools according to the settlement that you have 
on, on your delivery file. So just be careful of that. Deleting pools after final certification. Just some tips we want to make sure we give the users because this always come up as part of the processing. Contact the Genome Customer Service Support Group at 1833 Genome Help. That's 1833 466 2435. Pools can only be deleted between the hours of 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time by the PPA. That's a pool processing agent. So you just want to be careful on that if you're doing the, you want to do the 2 p.m. thing, you want to get your pool deleted during that time. Now, if the pool was certified and it's a part of the 9 p.m. suite, Issuers have up until 12 noon to perform the order delete on Geninet. So if you, the custodian certifies a pool after 2 p.m. and the next day you find out something is wrong, or darn, I don't need to issue this pool, I have the wrong maturity date, or my delivery instructions are not correct, I need to make a change. You as the issuer can make that change. You can go into that pool, delete it, but it must be before 12 noon. So very important, after 12 noon, if you try to delete that pool that has a status of certified, or you will not be able to. That's when it come, you would have to get in touch with us, make sure you give us a call, tell us you have a pool out there, we're gonna request that you send us an email so we can have the request that way. So we can delete that pool and send you back something via email so that pool has been deleted. So the nine, the, for those 9 p.m. sweep, you, the issuer, has the ability to delete that pool up to 12 noon if that's the case because you are doing your double checking and you find out something is wrong. You can delete it yourself. What I always say in that space, when you're doing the deletion on your own, please inform your custodian. And the reason why I'm saying this, your custodian, the last activity they did on that pool, of course, was to certify pool a, B, one, two, three, four, X, C, L. They certify the pool. So in their world, they're, they're moving on, but you found some mistakes that you need to make changes to. But you can, once you delete the pool, make sure you reach out to your custodian and said, I found a mistake. I may, need to add something to this pool, which I did, and I'm preparing to send the pool out again. Please look out for it because they might not even realize that, they're not gonna realize that the pool was deleted. So if you're sending it again, that pool could just be stuck out there and nobody actually touches it. So always remember to inform your custodian that you're deleting the pool. Most likely that pool will be resubmitted again because you make some changes. So they can have the proper documentation to validate and do their due diligence on their end. Next slide, please. Just some knowledge check, re recap some things that I just said. If you want to check the status of a pool, who can I call? You You want to call the, the Genome Customer Service Hotline, 1-833-466-2435. When can I recall slash order delete a certified pool? Pool slash loan packages that are certified after 2 p.m. can be deleted up to 12 noon Eastern Standard Time the next day. That's what I just went through. If I miss the window for order delete, what can I do? Of course, always call us. Give us a call at an 800 number. Tell us that you want to delete a pool. We're going to request that you send us an, an email so we have the audit trail for that. And then we're going to proceed once we get the information with the pool number. And we're going to delete that pool and send you back the, the, our, our answer saying the pool was deleted and then you can, you can perform. Just to tell you one thing, be careful if it's, I must always put this disclaimer there. If, if it's a regular PN pool, regular RX, regular LS, LM, it's good to go. You can process those pools right away after the pool is deleted. If it becomes a draw you're deleting, that's another, that's another thing. Just say, you're going to need to, this pool, you won't be able to put this pool into the system until the next day. The reason for this is because the draws are a little bit different. They have all these tables that are out there on the, on the back end. So although we delete that pool for you that day, you cannot go into Geninet or MFPDM and do the processing on that day. 
because again, there's some back end files that I ran overnight that's going to totally clean those files away from the information you you submitted. So just be careful on that. If it's a PN, a, uh, you can delete and and go in right away once the status has been changed to delete and set up the new pool. If it's a seal, those are going to be a little bit pro problematic in terms of when you can go back and we suggest if you call us today, we're going to tell you to go back in tomorrow morning to set up that pool because we have to do those refresh overnight with the seal or sales tables. So that is something I want you to also keep in mind if you're deleting a, a seal pool. Oh, great, Mary. I'm glad you have your sound now going. Fantastic. So fine. So no, I, I, I won't take an offense that I thought you were just you were just tuning me out. So I'm glad you have your sound going now, Mary. Good. Next slide, please. Prerequisites for pooling. That's that's what we're going to go into into next. Marvel, next slide, please. Thank you. We're going to look to talk about a little bit on the enroll enroll on MGM. When you say MGM, there it means, of course, my Genme Genme World. There's so many acronym. If you're a new person coming on board, wish you luck to know all those acronym. But that's 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 the usual usual talk around town with Jenime and these acronym, but there's always in the MBS guide, I think somewhere there's a glossary and it explains some of these things. Request secure ID token, introduction to my Jenime, the MGM portal, master agreement, commitment management, request pool numbers, and knowledge check. This is all we're gonna try and cover in the in this section while going in and out of traffic as we go, go through this this ride next slide please introduction to mgm and of course if you're a new user i hope you have actually set up yourself on on mgm if you're a new issuer also i hope you have actually gone through the process and getting your security your keep on saying that way it's no more security admin your org your org admin set up so they can actually set up the users so this is what it is now my genme is a single gateway to all genme system application and resources that boosts efficiency for a business partner the portal provides enhanced security and a single entry point to all approved application for individual users as well as seamless user registration and access request process for both the user and the approving authority. You have seen that if some of you, most of you have actually set up as a org admin, you know that there's a couple, couple things you have to do as an org admin. So you have gone through that process over that. I think we had done all the last year we were doing onboarding. We did training on onboarding. MyGenme will eventually replace GMAP1 and serve as a primary platform for extending information technology capabilities to Genome community. MyGenme delivers security features which Genome which Genome establish. Of course, if you're currently using MyGenme, you realize that, and if you're using Geninet, you should be going through MyGenme to access MyGenme. The same thing for MFPDM. And I hope that's what everybody's doing. And we have some of the some of the browsers that we see works best with that with that world, the MyGenme world. You have the Firefox, Chrome, and Explorer. Access to MyGenme, and of course, everybody should know the that https slash my.genme.gov using any of the browsers above. So this that's how you'll get into the system. One of the things that we try to do in this course, and of course the documentation are always out there on Genme's website, is give you the tools. We are giving you some information, but we're also giving you the resource. So you can use those resources and, and help you when you're in your office, when you're working from home, wherever most of us are working from now. So we have one of the main user map manual there, the My Genme Organization Administrator Guide. That's if you're a designated administrator, 
you are given that guide because you need to go through that guide and do the step-by-step -step process so you can get your users enrolled. Of course, if you're an authorized signer and you're designated a, a org admin, that would be, that's our responsibility at BNY Mellon. We'll send you out an invite. We'll ask you to fill it out, send it back, and we'll give you those functional roles or the, those privileged roles, I should say, that make you an, an org admin. So it's very important to actually read the user manual. And also, if you participated last year in any of those sessions, some of those recordings are still out there on Genome website on the modernization. So you might just want to take a look at that too. If you have a new org admin coming on board, you have the tools and the, in, the resource you can actually give them to be a part of the part of the process for MGM. Next slide, please. Okay, talking about MGM, I mean, you notice there have been some restructuring. It looks a little bit different. The roles are a little bit different, and we just wanted to talk to you about those roles a little bit. Org admins, and you're, you've been hearing org admins, if you are in the old space, you'll know hear about security officers or enrollment officers in the GenNet space. Now it's just org admin. The organization admin are privileged users who control system access, assign functional roles, and perform other user management activity. These individuals are responsible for ensuring that the end user at their prospective org are provided the appropriate levels of access for their business role with Genome and for the maintenance of those user accounts formerly known as security officer and enrollment administrator. Of course, security officers for GBAP and enrollment officers for GinniNet. This just kind of give you just a breakdown. There's an operation administrator. Operation administrators are us, are the BNY Mellon team. Per Genome, we act on behalf of Genome, so we do some of those functions. Org ad, the op ad administrator have general oversight of the portal. They can only finalize acknowledgement of the access requests and cannot make any changes to the end user's account. This function is provided by BNY Mellon Ops on behalf of Genome, with Genome Information Security serving as a super admin over the entire system. So, of course, if there's a new admin coming in town, it will be our responsibility for you, your responsibility to send us the information, our responsibility to do our due diligence, make sure that Wade Gale is on the 11702. Once that information is, is checked and verified, we can go into the system and send Wade an invite. We're sending you an invite as an org admin to, to, to come on board. Once you get that invite, you're going to fill it out. If you just want to be an org admin, we're going to give you those privileged roles. That means the privileged roles are you are able to set up someone and, and do the approval. So those are the things we at BNY Mellon will do. And of course, when you set up your users, we're also responsible for doing the finalization of those users. So the first admin sets them up, the second admin goes in and do the approval, and there's, there's a final authorization which happens on our end. So we go in and finalize those, those, those functional roles. So you, the user, will get notification go back saying it's done, and that is the appropriate time to go in, log in, and get in your system and, and start navigating and get to understand more about my genome. Now, the org admin. Org admins have the privilege to invite end users to register for a portal account, approve user registration, initiate access requests via functional role assignment to users and approve the access request within a single organization. Now we just wanna let, there's a big note here. Separation of duties within the registration and access request flow does not allow the org admin to initiate a registration and approve it at the same time. So that's why we usually say, Genme has two here, but really now Genme over last year, Last year, when we were doing the onboarding, they said three. Make sure you have at least three org admin to actually do the process. One sends the request to the end user. Once the end user gets that request and fill it out, it goes back into the pool. 
you as the sender should not be able to go in and do the approval is the second org admin will do that. Once it's approved, then you as the first admin now can go out and add those functional roles for that, for that person. And then of course you have the end users. And users are the various types of Genme employees, business partners, and contractors who require access to the business application information within the portal, including various self-service functions. And of course, you end users can all an end user because that's your company is small. So you have uh, your org admin, and also you have the end user function role because there's no one else that's going to go in and do an MFPDM pool. So I'm, I have many hacks that I have as a part of my work day. So, but you just want to make sure you have enough org admin to actually carry out the processes. So the part of the, the workflow. So we have the org admins, which is BNY Mellon. We're the ones who set up. No, that's not true, Wade. BNY Mellon is the operation admin. We set up the org admin in your shop. And then the org admin sends, sets up the, the end users. Next slide, please. Still on a re prerequisite for pooling. And this, again, some of you have because you become an org admin, you notice that we now have some of these, the structure is a little bit different than we had it in Geninet or we had it in, in MFPDM. We wanna make sure, not in MFPDM, in GMAP. Wanna make sure you, and of course there's also a table and user table to say what are these roles and what, what, who should get them. We have a couple of them here just to give you an idea. What, what are some of these roles and what you'll see when you're trying to set up, set up the user. And users are provided access based on their business activity. And again, Jen May is saying now, since we have actually grouped these roles, now like in first time setup in GMAP, you used to go in and give everybody some of those roles that were there for GMAP. And you know, Wade Gale or Jenny Jones never used, never did investor reporting. All I did was new pools. So, and I used to have all this other stuff on my system, which sometimes is not necessary. So what Jen may say now, if we can structure this in a way that uh, the functional roles can be, can be contained in a way that if Wade only does new pool processing, that means he's gonna be accessing only MF, MFPDM and Geninet. Let's see if we can structure those roles that he gets only that to do his job and not all the others which are not a part of his responsibility. So that's what we try to do here. I'm just gonna go through a couple of them that we, we put on the screen just as example. This is a SF loan delivery and pool in basic user. That's it's notice is, there's a basic user. Upload slash enter pool and loan information for delivery. You verify the ability availability of commitment authority, clear documents deficiencies, pooling exceptions, access to prepare but not execute pit transaction. That's if you do those pit pools issuance up up front. Now it says basic user. Then we go to the next user that says loan delivery and pooling authorized signer. Of course, if it was a, if you're a multiple, multifamily, you'll have MF before that. This one's the SF because the single, you'll have MF before that. So only for HUD 1172 signatories, all rights of a loan delivery and pool basic user plus authority to submit pools for issuance request additional commitment authority and execute the pit or the tie transaction. Now that's a big difference. If you as a end user, but you're also an authorized signer, you do not need, or your org admin does not need to give you both roles. You don't need the basic user role and also the authorized signer role if you're gonna submit pools. All you need is the authorized signer. Now. If someone is a basic user, that means all they do, do is the data entry, Just make sure all everything is okay, printer reports, and make sure everything looks good before the pool is submitted. 
You just need the basic user role. If you're not gonna submit pools, you don't need the authorized signer role. So I'm just trying to make, to take away some of the clutter from your shop because over the last year or so, we have seen most people who are authorized signer get basic user role also. That's not necessary because once you are authorized signer, everything that's a part of the basic user is in that authorized signer role. So just wanna share that with you. Then you have the MF investor reporting, basic user is basically the same thing. If the person is just doing loan, is just doing RFS information and they're not doing any submission, they don't need to get the authorized signer role. If you're an authorized signer and you don't, you don't need to have the basic user just to, just to show you that. So those are some of the roles. We usually try and update this as much as possible if there are any changes so the users are aware of the new, the new functional role. So I think this is very neat the way Jenny set this up now. Users just have the ability to just go in and and choose and choose the roles that they needed so they don't have to clutter their clutter their system. Okay, is there any questions or anything before I move on to slide 13? Is there any question in the chat before I move on? Hi, Wade, this is Sylvia again. Just wanted to um, take this moment while people are um, deciding whether or not they want to add something to the chat, if they haven't, to please, um, I'm asking everyone just to do a quick check of your personal chat to make sure that you didn't receive a message from me. I want to make sure that we have everyone who's been registered to attend, um, um, that we have the correct person in that slot for attendance. So please just do a quick chat of your personal check, your personal chat to make sure that you um, have not received a message from me. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Sylvia. Okay. Okay, Maribel, let's let's turn the corner and get on this street to Slide 13, Pre prerequisite for pooling. These are some of the things that we think you, you will need to get started. So we try to kind of put it on, 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 this, on, on this slide. So if you agree with us, just that's, you can always show your hand. If you don't, you can also mention something in the, in, in, in the chat. Introduction to MGM, the issue responsibility. Of course, the first thing that we talk about, you have to enroll, enroll as users on the MyGenome portal with function roles that allow the upload of master agreement. The form 11702 identif identify the authorized signers. You have to get access to GenyNet. And, and of course, if you're gonna use GenyNet, you also have to get access to MFPDM that most people are actually using now. You have to request sufficient commitment authority to guarantee the MBS, M, MBS issuance, of course. You can't issue GenMay pools if you haven't gone through that process. You have to obtain pool numbers. Pool numbers are a very important part of the process. Can I just make up a six-digit number because GenMay say it's a six-digit number? So it, it goes through sequence, so those pool numbers can be assigned to you. You, you, you upload your master agreements, the Form 11702, which identifies the authorized signer. That's one of the first thing you want to do when you set up anyway. You request your secure ID token. Very important if you're an authorized signer. You're going to need to request that token, send it in, so we can set up your token and send it back to you, and you can have that token to do your, to do your submission. Of course, the token is going to need a four-digit PIN, of course, which you're going to set up. Try and make it a, a, a four-digit that you can remember. Don't put in anything too hard that when you're trying to retrieve that pin, it, you're, you're stuck because that could be a problem. Because that, then if you don't remember, that has to be redone and, and set up all over again. So of course, you're gonna need that four digit pin. And then of course, once that four digit pin is in, the system does generate a active for six digit passcode, which you'll put in to move on to, to do some other things. So of course, the token is used in a, in a couple of places. So that's so it's not only used for new pools. If you're doing 
submission of of master agreements, commitment, all those things you're going to need a token for. So, so just be careful on that. What we did on this screen also, we gave you documentation. RSA, secure quick reference card. If you need to know more information on the RSA token, it's always the first time you get in that token or that token file, but people used to say it, it might be a little bit scary or you might be used to it already because maybe some other parts of your job you do use that that to that hard token. Most people might use a, even a soft token on their on on their on their on their phone itself. And you also want to get familiar with the General National Association access form. That's that form that you're going to need to fill out if you're if you're designating a new org admin for your for your company. So we you fill out that form and send it into it, and from that form we'll do our due diligence, make sure everything is okay, and we'll send the request out via MGM for that new org admin. So, if, of course, you have to enroll on, on my agenda, man. Get that 11702 set up, if you're, especially if you're a new user. Get that. That's the first document you want to send in, 11702, get it approved. Then you go in and set up all the other forms because you're gonna need sufficient commitment authority. You're gonna need pool numbers to do all of these things. So you're gonna need your RSA token. And again, as part of the process, we try to give you the, the resources. If sometime you call us and we'll, we'll tell you the information on the, on the phone also, but we're making sure that you can be a little bit independent sometime. You can read the document. Of course, sometime you might read and I'm like, I don't get this. I'm calling Wade and his, and his team. That's that's fine with us, but we just want to make sure you have some of the information that can help you during your daily process. Next slide, please. Okay, most people might be, if you see this screen, you might be a little bit familiar with it. This is the introduction to MGM, the portal login screen where it says login and this is what the MyGenMe first page looked like when you, when you, when you, when you log in before you put in your user ID and password. Next slide. And of course, you're familiar with this thing. The good thing about my Jenny May, I'm sure you have experiences of, you have noticed it by now, it's a one-time login. You don't have to log into GennyNet. You don't have to log into MGM. You don't have to log into RFS. All those, and I know those 50 million passwords plus the 10 million that you use with your other system in your daily work at, at in the office. Now, and what we did, or what Jen May did, which is a little bit more unique now, it's your, your username is your email address. So that's what your username is. That's how you identify. You're not identify any more by Mary. Or, or Wade Gale, you're no identified by your username. That's how you log in. So, so you put in your username, your password that you have actually created from the, from the direction that the password setup section would give you. And then you click on login. And of course, one of the things I should also, in, right at the bottom of this, it does say forget password. You as a user, if you forget your password, you can always go in that forget your password and 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 go through that process. You don't have to actually call us. Not that we're saying we don't mind getting your calls, but we're, it's trying to make it a little bit more efficient for you, so you can actually do that on your on your own. One thing I should tell you though, and this is per Jenny May, if you are an end user and you are locked out of the system by any way, by some chance if you get your password, things are not going well and you can't log in, the first person you need to reach out to is your org admin. If you're an end user and you call the hotline and you said, I can't get in, my password is disabled, we're gonna send you right back to your org admin. This is per Jenny May. They're saying, if an org admin call us, we are gonna assist them because that's that's the that's the that's the level. Ops admin assists the org admin. 
since the org admin accept and is the one who's ad administrating these end users, is their responsibility to, to actually, if this person is logged out, to try and reset them. So if you, over the year, if you did get call, call us and to reset your password and we ask you to go back to your org admin, it's not because we don't want to do it. We're just following Genme's instructions. So all administrative stuff should be done by the org admin. Of course, if there's something that's out of the way and things on the org admin cannot take it, cannot take it on because there might be more than just a login issue, by all means, that's when we would have to take it on. And maybe we would have to maybe do an escalation to our technology team to come to get involved to, to get you going. But for password reset and those things, if you call us as an end user, we're gonna ask you to go back to your account, go back to your org admin to, to get that reset. Some of the things we hear on the phone, I do not know my org admin. I get, we get that so many times. I do not know who my org admins are. Is my org admin Wade Gale? No. Wade Gale works for BNY Mellon. He's not going to be the org admin. So, and again, end users know your org admins. And it's no, we are, we have no problem telling you who your org admins are. So you can actually go to them and, and get this resolved. And I, again, I'm saying, if this is more than org admins issue, by all means, we're, you're gonna we're, you're gonna come back to us, and then we're gonna try and see if we can resolve the issue in terms of setting it up so you can log in. Logging into my Genme, the quick reference card, and we try to do that with those little documents instead of giving you the user manual. Those quick reference card help much easier. People remember those things quicker. The little quick tips instead of actually going through the process and reading the user manual. So make use of those. Uh, those quick reference cards. I always say people that are out there on the on the Genmaze website, maybe for you, you just download that and put it somewhere on one of your drives and just call that quick reference card MGM. And then if you need anything quickly, you can just go there and see if you get the answer there. If the answer is not there, by all means, then you're going to call that, that 833 number and, and speak to one of us or send us an email. Next slide, please. Okay, this is what, of course, when you log in, this is what the dashboard look like. We're gonna go through this a little bit more when we when we go through some other things. Inside of my Genome, the dashboard screen will appear. My dashboard is a landing page that has been tailored for different user type to provide easier access to key information and applications. Now, this, uh, this is a good part about it. Because in your old world, you used to log into GennyNet. That's the I5, whatever your ID was. In your old world, you used to, log, if you did new pools and investor reporting, which a lot of people do those things, you log into GMAP with the, the one of those GMAP ID, I something, and you log in. So right there is two logins right there. And then you might have four other logins with your, some of your internal systems. We eliminated all of that now because it's, it's single sign-on, single sign-on, SSO, single sign-on. So once you sign on with your user ID, which is your email address, and you land on this page, you have other areas to go. There's a section here that would say maybe tools, and then you go to tools and you'll find some other things. You might see RFS there because that's one of the roles you got. You might see GennyNet. You might see MFPDM. So, so that's easier for you. And you're clicking on that link and then you're going straight into the program. You are not putting in a password at a time again because it's your own single sign-on, SSO, one-time login. And I know I've heard, I've heard from some people and they said they like this. It, it makes their life a little bit easier because I don't have to remember all these different passwords. So this my single password, of course, the, you have that, you you have that code that you have to also use when you when you put it in the one time pin the OTP that's a part of the process too. So this is what your dashboard will look like. Further down on this dashboard, you'll also see certain things like your commitment authority and your pool numbers are, uh, remaining. So that can help you plan your day in terms of 
How many commitments? Do I, how much money do I have? How many pools can I issue? So all those things can help you. How many pool numbers do I still have? Do I need to do another request for other pool numbers? So that dashboard gives you all that comprehensive information. Depends on how it's set up and what are some of the user types you have in in your on your profile. One thing on this page, since I'm here, I don't know if, right up here where it says your username, if you're a first time user, when you click on that, most likely you'll see your Ishra number. We're gonna ask you to make sure you default your Ishra number there. Default your Ishra number, because if you come in and you're looking at the screen, you're gonna see a screen, it might be blank and you might get an error message. And the first thing when you call us, we're gonna ask you, did you default your Ishra number? You're gonna say no. We're going to instruct you to do that. And then you're going to say, oh, Eureka, there's my page. It looks, everything is okay now. I can see my issue number. I can see my name. So the first thing when you're getting on this page and it's the first time user, go up to there and click on that area that has the avatar. Maybe I might have a picture there of yourself. And if you see a four-digit issue number there, click into it so it can update and populate that, that information so your dashboard will look much better. That's one of the first tip I want to give the new users if you're logging in for the first time. Make sure you click your default issue number from, from that avatar area right there. Next slide, please. Just more information on the on the Genome homepage, just to see what it said. You have some little carousel here, it depends on what you want. You can you can you can move them along. And down here, give you some information on your on on your pool, and especially just some notices you have here too. Sometimes, if you have doing if you're doing MSPDM, it gives you some information on on the status of your pool. Was the pool submitted successfully? You can also read some of those things here too. Further down here, you'll see it says commitment authority. We did not capture the page, but it says commitment authority here and pool number. So that will give you an idea of what your what your makeup is for that day, because we don't want you to set up pools and you don't have no money or you did not request any pool number. So just pay close attention to, to, to the information on, on, on your dashboard. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have talked about my genome, we have talked about what's needed. I know we are getting into the into some of the application that's needed in, in, in order to, to work this process. First one we, we have here is the accessing the master agreement management system. That's MAMS. You might hear the word MAMS via MGM. Again, from any screen in MGM portal, select the tools. The tool section is, is the most important thing right now, because when you, once you select tool, you'll see all the properties that you have here. So you, your system might look something like this. Over here, you might see RFS if you do investor reporting. If you do Geninet, you might, Geninet is gonna be found on the other application, you'll see Geninet. And isn't that sweet? And isn't that just great? You don't have to go in and click and come up with a user ID again. It just click and it goes straight into, it goes straight into MAM. So this one takes you into, into MAMS. Click on the tools, you select MAMS. And if you look at a section that says three master agreement and it says master agreement error, that's where you'll fall in. You go straight into the program and you can proceed with your processing. So that's a, that's a much easier process than logging in into GMAP, then choosing MAMS and going to the process. One thing, MGM, select tools. If you do have MAMS as part of your functional roles, you'll see it there, you select that and you go through the process of setting up your master agreements. Next slide, please. Okay, just some information here on the master agreements. Genome must complete, Genome issues, not Genome. Genome issues must complete initial master agreement submission to be eligible to issue Genome pools. Issues are required to submit a complete set of master agreement which consists of forms listed in the table below. And I've, I don't know if any of you on the, on the call today was a part of that experience that you just had finished maybe mm, 12 days ago, 
you had to have your master agreements in by 6.30 because Genmi had extended the time and now there's no for, for renewals of 2020. So right now you can't renew anything. If you miss it, you'd have to end up setting up all your forms all over again. Let's look at some of the forms that's needed in the master agreement. We have the HUD form, 11702. That's the resolution of board of directors and certified authorized signer. You, as a user, as a company put on there, these are the people that are authorized to do, to do work for us on behalf of Jenny May. So you'll have the, you'll have the names there and, and, and their title. Then you had the HUD. 11703-2, the Master Agreement for Participation Accounting. And the form is there because it's one of the requirements, but it might not be a required form for you if, as a multifamily. That's if you're in the HMBS program, that's one of the forms you will actually need. You have the HUD, 11707, that's the Master Subservice Agreement. Master Servicing Agreement, that of course, you have to fill that out if you have subservicers, and if you're even servicing on your own, you need to fill that out also. HUD 11709, Master Agreement for Services, P&I Custodial Account, very important because you're gonna need those P&I account as part of your new pool processing. Then you have the 11709A, your ACH debit authorization, and this form does not require renewal. I noticed on a yearly basis, I'll see people send it in, but there were no changes. So if there are no changes to your account, but you don't need to, that form should not even be showing up for renewal anyway. But if you do it, it's gonna come in and just replicate what's already on the system. So if it's, it's not a renewal form, only time you need to submit an 11709A if you're changing your accounts. If you don't have your, your Genmay one or your Genmay two accounts, if you're changing those, then you need to submit a new form. But if the, the same form, accounts you're using for the next coming year, you don't need to submit that form again, actually. HUD 11715, that's the master custodial agreement. And of course, if you're out there in the space now, a lot of people are making some changes to their custodial account because they might've been using BNY Mellon and BNY Mellon is getting out of the business. I think, I think they have until August, sometime next month to finish all their to do diligence for Genme and the issuer. So you might have gone through creating a new form because you're now using a new custodian because it was BNY Mellon before. And then you had the HUD 11720, that's your master agreement for subservicer, escrow custodial account. So those that's another form or accounts that's needed when you're doing your new pool processing. So just wanna give you an idea what the forms are and, and, and the actual form names. Okay, if I'm talking a little bit too much, someone can ask a question and I'm willing to help you. But if not, I'm just gonna move on. Maribel, can we go to slide 20? More on the master, master agreement form. And then here we have a master agreement management system, the MAMS guide. Take that, this is just telling you again, we try and give you the resources. The, the, the guide tells you how to do the process. The MAMS quick reference card again. We have the guide, but we have a quick reference card that provides the procedure and information for the topics on how to create a form, how to print your agreement, how to upload or import the complete form, search and view the forms, and the submission center. We have the submission center there because you have to set up your form and actually submit them for to either BNY Mellon, if, if the, you're, you have a subservice, so you have to send certain form to the subservices, so they have to sign off on them. So let this 11707, if it's, there's a subservicer on there, that form goes to the subservicer plus Jenny May for approval. So, so there's a lot of things that happens within the behind the scenes in, with some of these forms. The first form we usually recommend you submit, of course, is the 11702. We have to get that information up on the system so you can actually proceed once that approved by the PPA, which is us at BNY Mellon. To, once that form is approved, that gives you the go ahead to go in and add all the other necessary forms for master agreements. Next slide. 
Okay, when and how to update mass agreements. As I mentioned, we just shut off the renewal, new, renewal process. We get generally extended that for six months because of all the COVID activity. People might have been, most people were displaced or working from home. So it might have been a little bit harder getting your master agreements in. So that was, it was extended to June 30th. And so the extension is out and we're back to normal now. So if you did not renew and you have a pool, you'll have to end up going, setting up all over again as initial master agreements for 2021. On an annual basis, issuers must recertify their eligibility by completing the renewal process. Jenny May requires a recertification of master agreements annually between October 1 to December 31st. Very important. I always tell people, don't ignore the October 1 date. If you are good, my issues, my friends, if you are good for your renewals for 2022, and when you get a notice that renewal starts on October 1, and you're, you sh you're sure that those accounts are gonna be used for 2022, and you have everything in order, why not go in and do your research, recertification? I'm pushing you this way because I don't want you to wait until December 29. Because you know what? You might need people to authorize things. Maybe you need to send something to the subservicer for 11709 and 20 form and they're not around. So those forms might not get done for the year. So in Jen May's eye, come January 1st, you're delinquent and you might not be able to issue your Jen May pools. So all these things are in play. So if you can get this out as early as possible, get that master agreement down, Pat, that's done, for, that's shut down for 2022. I'm done with that. I can move on. I can have my long Christmas vacation. I can do my, my long Thanksgiving vacation. I don't have to worry about that. That's off. We're set for 2000. We're set for 2022 on our master agreements. So I'm just telling you, it's very important. Don't wait until the last minute. And I'm saying this because I've experienced this being in the office during that last week and people are running and trying to find this person to say, oh, I don't have the person. My manager, she's currently in, in Cancun on her Christmas vacation and she won't be able to sign the pool. And I'm like, I hope you don't have any pools to issue for the new year because if you do, those pools are, those pools are not gonna go because you won't have valid master agreements for 2022. So just keep those things in mind or maybe it's not you We'll be doing this, but you might have to inform maybe your investor reporting team because there's certain documentation they might need. They might have to say, yes, we're using these same PNI and TNI account going forward for 2022. So you have to get the go ahead from them. So make sure you try to solicit that information a little bit early before, before December 31st. Important to start certifying the process as early as October 1 to reduce the year end spike in volume. So true. Every year we go through that. But this year, Jenna May did extend it, I should say, until six months because of the on that the on that circumstances with COVID and all of that stuff. But I don't think they're gonna do it unless something else happens that that warrants that. So try and meet that deadline. It starts October 1st, December to December 31st every year. If a user Issuer does not complete their recertification within the re renewal period, they will not be eligible to issue Jenna pools and will have to repeat the initial submission process. Yep, that is so true. Because uh, if you have pools for January 1st or the first week of January, but your master agreements were not renewed, those accounts are gonna be coming up as being invalid. So you can't even select them to on JennyNet or, or MFP them to do your process. So. Very important, get those master agreements in as soon as possible. Any questions? Welcome back, everyone. I hope you were able to go and maybe just stretch your feet. If you're in the office, good good luck. You can go and if you're at home and you have kids, you're able to just look at them, make sure everything is okay. If you have any pets, look at them, make sure everybody's okay and then we can get back to 
our training. Is there any question before I move on to the, to, to the next slide? And I, let me just say good morning and hello to our account executive. I think we have two. Is there anything on Je from Jennifer or Patrick on the line? Do you guys want to say anything? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but. Wait, I think our multi-family team um, will be silent partners unless they get specific questions that they need to answer. Thanks. Okay. Well, Holter, this is Patrick here. I'm sorry, uh, Sylvia Wade. Just want to say uh, thank you from the multifamily team for doing an exceptional job as always. And this is always good to learn from the masters for Wade and the BNY team. So please enjoy. Thank you very much, Patrick. Maribel, can you proceed to the next slide, please? Good. Okay, thank you very much. We talked about MAMS. Now we're going to talk about an, another, the commitment management piece. And again, we're trying to build up these are the prerequisite, make sure we have all the information, all the data elements so we can actually start doing our pools. So accessing commitment management via MGM again. It's from any screen in the MGM portal, you select the, to the tools drop down at the top of the screen. Always going to see the tool there. You're going to see the application called CM commitment management. And again, I tell you that everything is is an acronym name, so you have to be familiar with these with these programs. And uh, number three, select commitment management. Of course, this is where you go in and do your commitment re request commitment from from Genome. So this is what the screen will look like when you start on the first page of MGM tools. And then on the IPMS, you'll select that CM. In this space, back in the days, you will log in and go to CM in G, GMAP. But of course, that's not what we do anymore. We go to single sign on now, MGM tools, then we select the application that we need to process, to use the process. Next slide. And again, this is the commitment authority CA request. An issuer must comply with Genome's eligibility requirement and have sufficient commitment authority available to successfully issue Genome securities. Commitment authority allows an issuer to issue up to an authorized dollar amount of security on, and constitute a commitment line balance. And of course, commitment management application replaces the manual submission of documents submission of fees via pay.gov and provide an issuer with an automated method to submit the request. You can confirm the associated commitment fee, proactively monitor their commitment authority balance and request status. You can submit payment instruction for ACH debit of commitment fees, and you can also request reports. If I'm not going to ask who was around back then when they used to do this in a manual form, but thank God for commitment authority. CM now, this I think this system is much faster in terms of getting getting things done. Next slide, please. And again, just we kind of set it up just like we have the MAMS, and again, just to give you guys the information that you need. Commitment management application issue a guide. That's the guide you can go through and, and get the information on how to do the process. Submit request, you can find it on page six to 10. Confirm the associated commitment fee that's on 12. Proactively monitor their commitment authority balance and request status. You can find it on page 14 and 27. And submit payment instructions for ACH debit. You can find it on 10. And the request to report, you can find that between 18 to 21. So we, we just kind of give you the information here, but use the manual, read through it. So if there's any questions or concerns in going through the process, 
Sometimes you have to use a manual and it might not be 100% clear to you. So read and then call us back. If you call us on the hotline, if we can help, if you think you might need some clarification from your account executive at Genome, also reach out, reach out to them. So that, but we want, we want to make sure you have the resource so you can actually start on your own or you train your team that way. And then if there are any questions that are coming up because of the process, you, you'll give us a call. Next page, please. Next screen. And again, this is just, can't forget those quick reference card. I always say, if you don't want to read the user manual, the quick reference card is the way to go. That should give you the short, the short answers, how to get from point A to point B, how to do the commitment management information. So we have the quick reference card there, and it talks about the commitment management, the summary screen, of course, the view, the submitted reports, and how to run the reports. So those are, that's maybe, I think this might have been, back in the days when we did this, might have been a one pager or not more than two pages to just get you going that way. And again, all these can be found out there on the, on the Genmay website. If it's best for you to view them that way, that's fine. If it's best for you to actually download them and have them set up in a one little section on your on your drive, that might that might also work for you. Who knows? Some people are still working from home. Some people are in the office. If you're in the office and you can print it, more power to you. So if you're working from home, most likely you might not have one of those printers that's set up from from the office to print here. So you might have to save it in a in a PDF file and keep it somewhere on your drive. So you have all those abilities. So we're just giving you those options to either the user manual or the quick reference card to help you with this process. Next slide, please. So we have done the commitment authority. We have done MAMS, and we now we want to look at requesting pool numbers. And again, it's basically the same thing. You're going to go into, log into the MGM. You're going to choose the section that says tool. On the tool, you're going to see RPN, request pool number, and then you're going to proceed if that's one of your responsibilities. So you see the three red lines there, or three squares, or that's that square way, that's a rectangle. Three re rectangle there, the one that says tools, the next one on the IPMS says RPN, and the number three says request, select request pool number screen, and you see that that's what's highlighted there. So that's easy. You're in the system, no more logging into GMAP and go through that. Once you do this, it takes you right to the area that you want. SOS, SO, single sign-on, one, one, SSO, SOS, SSO, single, single sign-on, SSO, not SOS, SOS is something else, but single sign-on, and you get right into the program and you can do your, your work much more efficiently that way. Next slide, please. Most of these slides are set up basically to show you that the information is there and how you can get them. Request pool number is an application that Genome issuer use to request pool numbers. Duh, that's quite obvious. It replaces the current paper form 11700 letter of transmittal for commitment authority and or pool numbers. Now, if anybody's still using that form or remember that form, you're old school. In the request pool number application, issuers have the ability to perform the following procedures. And of course, we have the request pool number application issuer guide for you. You can enter the request, tells you from the guide what page you, you'll see that. You can view the available pool numbers in the queue. You can submit override requests to Genome account executive for additional pool numbers. You can view the status report. You can request and download the report, and you can receive real-time approval of request. And of course, all the page numbers are here. If whichever one of these tasks you want to go to, the page number is here for you to actually find it on the on the on the user guide. Next slide, please. And again, 
we always tell you guys we have that quick reference card that provide the, the, the quick, how to do it much quicker than actually reading through the guide. The reference card mentioned stuff about the RPN submarine screen. We talked about the, how to request the pool number, how to download the, the number, view the status of the pool numbers and also run reports. So that's what the, the quick reference card give you. And again, you can always print this. You can always save this to somewhere on your, on your hard drive, whichever works best for you in, in your shop. Next slide, please. Just want to go through a couple of these things just to make sure you have them and you're aware of them. So I'm still prerequisite. You want to make sure you have everything before you start setting up a pool. GMAP pool in record. Ensure there are assigned pool numbers. Check your available pool numbers or request pool numbers. Ensure there's adequate commitment authority. Check your commitment management. Ensure there are complete master agreement on file. Check master agreement management and complete and the complete form HUD 11709A for your ACH debit authorization form. You want to make sure you have all of these. If you don't have complete master agreements, if you send a couple of forms and 11715 and 11709 are not done, you're not going to get a complete there. So you could submit the pool. The pool is going to fail. It's going to come back when you apply the GenMe edits. It's going to say master agreements not available, or I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the edit, or oh, master agreement is not completed. You're going to get a message like that because the master agreement that you selected are not current master agreements. So it's very, very important that you have your master agreements in and you have your, you know, your commitment authority is also good to go. You don't want to be subbing the pool for $10 million and you only have six. That, that's going to be a failure on the back. And then you're going to get a call from us saying, hey, you don't have enough money. The pool came back rejected. You have to reach out to your account executive on this to make sure you can get the uh, correct funds so this pool can be issued. And, and stuff like that, if that's not done, what that does in the process, it delays other things because you might have already set up your pool with, with your investors for delivery on such and such day. But because of this one misstep, your pool might get delayed because it might take you some time to go through the process and wire all that necessary information that gentleman needs to continue the process. So it's so good that you get all these things in order before you proceed with the actual processing. Next slide, please. Okay, what, what we did here, just to give you an idea, we just have some quick little vignettes, video just to show you how to, how to do, the, do the process. It's, we're gonna show, start it once, once we do it, I'm gonna do the, the voice over to these little, little vi videos and then you'll get an idea. If, if it's the first time you're seeing what the, the process look like, create a new form for master agreement, how to, how to do commitment management and how to request pool number. So if Barbell and team have those videos set up, can, can we roll them so I can proceed to talk? Wait, are we doing, um, we're doing master agreements first, right? The MAMs, correct? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. I'll pull it up right now. Bear with me. All right. I'll go ahead and start playing it if everyone can see it. Yes. Okay. We are going to go into tools and on the tools, we're going to go to IPMS. We're going to choose MAMS. And once the screen come up, we're going to go to the section that says create pool forms. We're going to choose from the drop down. We're going to choose 11702. Then we're going to proceed to enter the information.
We're going to enter the secretary's name. We're going to enter the certifying officer's name. The certifying officer's title. Anything that's in that asterisk need to be filled in. We're going to go down and put in the address. City, state, and zip. It's just a little quick reference of how to do it. Select the state and the date. Of course, you know, a date is a little bit outdated because we did this video sometime in, in May. So just don't pay any attention to the date. It's just real time. That's of course, it would be a real time date. Once that done, you replace existing. We're going to say no, because we're not replacing. We're setting up new, new names. So we're going to just put in the person's name, middle name. If there's one, last name and title. Once that's done, we're going to click as on choose a file. Now, the, this file is, of course, the one that's a, already signed. We're going to sign that signed form. You're going to upload the form. Once the form has been uploaded, it's, it's going to save as draft. Save as draft. Once you can get, get the message that issuer is save as draft. Now we want to go in and, and actually look look at that thing and say where it says add to submission center. You see it? It's added there. Click on that. Add to submission center. Then I can proceed to actually submit the form. I'm going to get the message, selected form has been, then we click on Submission Center. This is when an authorized, the person who's authorized is going to click on Submit, read the legal information there. And we're going to click on Accept and submit the form. Of course, this is when you put your four-digit PIN and, and, go, and your six-digit passcode and do the OK button once that's done. And once it's done, it, it goes through and it's, and it's submitted to your to the pool processing agent. And that's when the pool processing agent will get it and do their due diligence, check the name, make sure everything is OK, and do the certification. So that's MAPS. Now let's go to the next next one. Going to go through the basic, the same thing that we showed you in those screens. We're going to go to tools again. This time we're going to select on the M. We're going to select CM. And we're going to do click on request commitment. We're going to select the type. We're going to put in the request amount. Once that amount is in, it, it's also going to generate a commitment fee. Fee due, you'll see the amount there. You put in your ACH routing number. You enter the number again for, you enter the, enter the account this time. You're going to put in the verification of the account again. Once it's done, you want to make sure you read Jeremy's disclaimer there before you proceed. And you're going to submit the request. Therefore, you just have a little information coming up before you actually submit if you're okay. If you're okay with that, you click on okay. And that, of course, you're going to put in your, your token information. Would you pin and six to the passcode and submit off to your AE? Though the one more to go is the, is a the pool number. Request pool numbers. Your organization has been adequate. You have adequate, so you're going to request like 
an override because we have enough pool numbers. We're going to just put in something there. So Jen May will get that. Your request is like an override. Request AE override. Request is in process. Please contact your AE if you have any questions. And this is the, the reason we did this right here. Just to give you an idea, and the one, the last one we did for pool numbers was because we had already done a request and we had enough, but we realized that we needed more pool number. But the system says you you have to get an override, so that override have to approve before Genmay can give you. So we're requesting 50 pool numbers more, so it goes through that override. But if you're doing this for the first time, I think, Maribel, can you, is it, how many pools can you request first? Is it 10 or 50? I'm guessing Maribel is, is here, but she's not here. So that's give, that just give you a quick look at idea of what the process is. What, what I just did might even help you in your world if you're actually training someone on this, because this is just, they can actually talk through this themselves as they, as they go along with the screen. So that's, that's what I did. We recorded these things silently. And then I put in the, the voice to it, so it give you an idea what needs to be done. So this can also work as a training tool in your shop if you, if you want to do that. I know Jen May did say that these sessions will, it'll, is going to be available on, on, on their website. So that, that could be something you can use, or if you find it useful, you can always record this on your own if, if, if that, if that makes sense also. So that was able, we were able to do the master agreement 11702 show you how to do the commitment management that's requested in there, and also the commitment and request the pool numbers. Next slide, please. And before we go into the poll, are there any questions, any questions or concerns here before we move on onto the poll? One, one, I just, before we do the poll, I just want to say a couple of things about, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but just want to mention it again. On, on the pool number, make sure you have the correct pool number. When you request those pool numbers, if it, I'm just going to use this as an example. If you request 10 pool numbers and you have actually used those 10 and you just went in this, you just decided, you know what, I requested 10. And it ends with nine, nine, seven. So of course my next number is going to be nine, nine, eight. No, because you know what? Somebody went up there and requested that nine, nine, eight again. So don't assume that your next number will be nine, nine, eight. If you do put nine, nine, eight in and you're setting up for a PN, what's going to happen if it's on GenNet? The system takes. You shouldn't be doing it on GenNet anyway. And what happens? It's going to fail on the back end. Saying that pool numbers, that pool number does not belong to the issuer. And as I'd mentioned earlier, that delay, because the pool number issue, we'll have to get in touch with you, the issuer, and tell her that this pool number came in and it's saying it does not belong to issuer one, two, three, four, because it's really not yours if you really check it out. You just went to use the next available number that maybe issuer two, three, four, five might have already use and that number is linked up in the system to them. So be careful of just requesting 10 and say, let me just use the next available 11. There's a possibility it might can happen because nobody ever requested. But make sure you have the numbers that are requested are linked to your issuer number. Same thing with commitment. Make sure you have enough commitment to issue these pools. I think on a daily basis, there is a commitment balance that's sent to e-notification. And that, that's real time balance. Every morning, I think it's there in eNote. So if you have eNote as part of your functional roles, make sure you check that if this is your responsibility to actually send pools out and make sure the pool have the correct and the, 
a correct amount so you can issue issue these pools. Okay, we have a poll. I guess this is a poll just to see some of the things that we talked about, if it's still registered and you're able to answer the, the polling question correctly. Okay, who's gonna run the poll? Okay, our first question. Pool numbers must be requested after the must be requested after the pool is submitted. Is that a true statement or is that a false statement? Waiting for the answer. I see more. Listen, I'm going to read it again. Pool numbers must be requested after the pool is submitted. Is that a true or a false? False. Yeah. Answer on the chat. The person, what, you're giving the answers out. Okay, the, the answer, that one person who said true, I think they're just playing with me. I'm sure they are on there. Because that's, that's that you cannot request the pool numbers after the pool has been submitted. The, the pool numbers, you have to, <laughs> thank you, thank you, for, thank you for, for, for changing that. The answer is actually false. The, you have to do that request before you, you actually go into Geninet and start setting up the pools. That's what I was saying. It's very important to make sure those pools belong to you. Someone is asking a question. Could you explain how assigned pool numbers are handled when the, the loan is refinanced? If the loan is refinanced, I'm assuming is the pool number already issued and you're issuing that, you're issuing that loan again? It's then it, you can't use the same number. It would have to be used. A different pool number would have to be used. I hope that answers your question. But if it's not, if it's not clear, you, we can always talk offline, and and you could you could email me, email me some some more information on that, a Angela. Angela, are you saying my answer is false, or the answer to the question is false? Okay, that was question number one. How about question number two? This is like a trick question. Where do we go to submit your master agreement? Okay. We have GMAP, we have Geninet, and we have My Genime, My Genime Portal. And so far, 57% is saying my Genome portal, 38% is saying 33% now, 25%, 23, 20. It's dropping like they're dropping like flies now. 18% is still saying GMAP. No one is saying Geninet. No one is giving a no vote. So the reason why we did this one like that is because where we're never we no one actually log in and, and say we're going into GMAP anymore to do any transmission. So our preferred answer is my Genime portal because that's the vehicle now to go into tools and choose on the IPMS. You choose you you will choose master agreement. So the answer is actually GMAP, my Genime portal. So the 19 people who took part in this, I really appreciate that. I need to convince two people because they're still saying they're still saying GMAP. 
but it, the answer is actually, and one person retreated. So I'm waiting for the other to do the same, if they agree with me then. And they refuse to, but it's it's all good. That's, isn't that, it's always, you can agree to disagree sometime, but the answer is my Jenny portal is, is, is the correct answer that we were looking for. Okay, number three. An RSA token is required to submit your request for commitment. If you remember that short little demo that we did, there was one of the items that we did not need, use a RSA token to do the submission. So which one was it? Was it BAMS? Was it commitment authority? Or was it request pool numbers? An RSA token is required to submit your request for commitment authority. I hope I did not convince that one per oh, the person. Good. The answer is actually true. An RSA token is needed for, for commitment authority. It's it's not needed for request pool numbers to 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 do the to do the token. So thank you for your participation in in our poll. We just wanted to make sure this some of the stuff that we talked about we were able to put in here. So just want to find out if people are still following following with us in terms of of the of our presentation. Any questions? And Angela, if I need to answer, if I if you need to get more information on on your answer, please please let me know. On on you can I'll put my email in the in the chat a little bit a little later before we before we finish the session. So thank you very much for your participation in, in, on our poll. The next next slide, Maribel. Genome website information. The reason why I put this here is just to give you issuers a little chat. You want to use that Genome website as that that's that's that should be your best friend because all the information is out there. I just wanted to there's a section there I wanted to concentrate on where it says issuer tools. You have multiple issuer pool number. Of course, it doesn't apply to to you multifamily users here. But if you do if you do the other pool types, you have the pool date calendar, the approved issuer directory. IOPP, PIT, ARMS Index, and unclaimed, unclaimed fund search. I'm just giving you some of the resources that you, you have can help you out. What I want to concentrate is the, what's on the next slide. Maribel, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Is a pool dates calendar. And this somehow will help you in your, in your planning. We didn't capture every one of the, 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 the dates on the calendar. But it has the dates on for for your RPB for your investor reporting. You have your dates for your new pools. When is the last day you can submit a new pool? That will help you. So you know you don't want to submit something that it's that we're not going to be able to to certify for for the month of for the month of July. So you you want to use those dates to your advantage for your new pool processing and also for your investor reporting part of your process. So I just wanted to show you that pool date calendar that I think can help you plan your day and know when your securities are gonna be ready. So you'll be in line with your custodian, when to send it to your custodian, so you're in line with your investors, when your invest, when the Fed will make the delivery. So all of those things you can have in line. If you need to share this with your investor reporting team, they might know it already, not the ones who actually do the work, just the one who prepared the stuff so you can actually do the monthly processing or your new pool processing people. You can share this calendar with them. It's out there on the Genme website. Use the website, use the MBS guide, use a section that I have to deal with, with, with multifamily, pool the draws, the, the permanent part of it, use that. Use us at BNY Mellon in terms of the application. If you get stuck somewhere, don't hesitate to give us a call. Use your 
get information from your account executive, use their expertise. They on the Genome policy part of it, they're they're more averse on the policy piece. If it's an application piece, they might say, let's call the let reach out to the to the hotline so we can walk you through that. So use us, use the resources and 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 try and make your life a little bit easier and actually plan in the session. This is our first piece of, of training with the pooling and the requisite re requisite just to get you started. Tomorrow, what we're gonna we're hoping to do is go a little bit more deeper into, into new pool processing. It will be a tape that was presented in January. We haven't done a brand new tape yet, but we are trying to just to give you an idea when we are in, introduce some some new features. So we'll go through that tomorrow as part of our new pool processing segment. So is there any questions or concerns now before I turn it over to, to Sylvia? Any questions, anything that I said that just, what did Wade Gale just say? That went over my head. So, and you wanna, wanna share anything with me? Let me put my, I said I was gonna put my email address here. And also our pin may want you. Anything on Geninet? Of course, just to let you know, if you're still using Geninet, you should only be using Geninet if you're doing if you're finishing up those those draws, there's type threes or type fives. Any initial pool, any initial pools, new pools must be done in MFPDM. Any initial pools must be done in MFPDM. Just just to just to put that out there. No initial pools right now are supposed to be do in it's just supposed to be done in Geninet. That will only happen if there are some circumstances and Jen may give us the go ahead to, to allow the user to do that. But in the initial pools right now, your draws, your PN, your CL, your RX, anything needs to be done right in, 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 in MFPDM, multifamily pool delivery module. Again, I'm going to ask any, any questions or concerns before I turn it over to Sylvia? I want to thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy the ride. I hope the ride was informative. I hope you were able to learn a couple of things, even if you are, this is a refresher for you. I hope I was able to actually give you a couple more tips and it made sense to you and it was informative. Again, thank you for your time and Sylvia, it's all yours.